Hey there, and welcome to the second of a series of videos I am making on limits and continuity for calculus. And uh, in the first video, we talked about how the definition of continuity was, or how continuity is defined in calculus, and, and we need to be able to use that definition to justify whether a function is going to be continuous or not uh, for calculus tests, for AP exams, anything like that. You have to have the calculus justification. So what we see here is that limits, what we've been discussing up until this point in a calculus class, is that uh, a limit will tell us where a function intends to go, whether or not it actually made it there or not. And you've seen, uh, particularly with rational functions, uh, points where we had a hole in the rational function. We had a point discontinuity. So the left and right hand limits showed that we should get there. And so the general limit would exist at that hole but there's no continuity there, and that's a big difference. Continuity will guarantee that you actually make it to that point, and it's a small but significant difference. So here we are classifying the types of discontinuities uh, that you can expect to see on various functions. On the left, we have the removable types of discontinuities, a point discontinuity, something we would think of typically as uh, a hole in the function. Uh, on the right side, in the middle and on the right, those two columns are, uh, those are going to be non-removable discontinuities. Uh, the two functions in the middle column are going to be a type of jump discontinuity and they cannot be removed. Neither can the asymptotes, whether it is a slant or a vertical asymptote like you see in the rational functions that you have. So out of the three types of discontinuities, point, jump, and asymptotic or asymptotic uh, discontinuities, only the point discontinuity can be removed. So now we're going to be looking at this particular function and we want to know can we tell the intervals upon which this is going to be continuous or not. So I'm going to go ahead and write this one out. I think it'll be a little easier here. Now we start with continuity. We start at x is equal to 5 because it looks like that's where it's going to begin. Now, is that 5 included or not? I don't know, because there's not a solid dot there indicating that it's being included. So I'm going to go from negative 5, and we travel along the x-axis to the right to a point where we see, uh-oh, looking here at the negative 3, I have a point discontinuity. So it can be removed, but a point discontinuity is still a discontinuity. So I'm continuous along the interval from negative 5 to negative 3, not included. Now I'm going to go from the negative 3 and I'm going to keep kind of going this way until I get to what appears to be a vertical asymptote here at the positive 3. So from the negative 3, which is not included, I'm going to be continuous along the interval and you can just kind of follow along from, you know, just tracing it going up this way. Uh, that it's going to be continuous from negative 3 to a positive 3. But again, the positive 3, we don't get there because it looks like there's a vertical asymptote. So I show that it's not included also. So on the right side of 3, I can see that I'm going to be coming down. And then I'm going to stop here because at a positive 5, I'm again encountering a point discontinuity. So I show that that's not included. Picking back up from the positive 5, I come up to here, and now I have a jump discontinuity that x is equal to 7. So here, I'm going to go from positive 5 to the 7. Now the 7, as I go from left to right, that 7 is included. So I put a bracket around it. And then I'm going to pick it back up here at the top of the jump discontinuity, and I'm going to kind of keep coming down this way until x is about 10. Now again, it looks like I'm going to 10, but I don't know if I get it. Now on the right side, or at the top side of that jump discontinuity, however you want to think of it, that 7 is not included, so I use a parenthesis again, and I go from 7 to 10. And the 10 is going to be not included. So those are going to be all of the intervals upon which the function appears to be continuous uh, uh, on the x-axis, or on the uh, domain. And that's how we would write it out. Now I'm going to go ahead and clear this out so we can take a look at uh, where are we going to have our discontinuities. So here this is here it is typed up, and I should have a bracket on that seven at the five and seven, but that's okay. Uh, so now we're going to be looking to see, okay, well where are the discontinuities? So I have 
some discontinuities. I have all three discontinuities represented here. I have holes, uh, which would be considered a point discontinuity at x is equal to negative 3, negative 1, and at a positive 5. And those are the types of discontinuities that are removable. At x is equal to 3, we have a vertical asymptote, so that is non-removable. And at x is equal to 7, we have a jump discontinuity, which is also not removable. Now what we're going to be taking a look at, and I'm not going to have much in the way of material to include with for you guys, but we're going to be including uh, some general concepts about continuity, just to make sure that you are aware of you know, what its definition is, how, what are some of its properties, and how is it going to be used. So here uh, we're talking about one-sided continuity. So this is very similar to the definition that we saw uh, in the first video, but here the left-sided limit and the defined point have to be the, si be the same for the left side or the right side. That's a one-sided uh, continuity. And here's really the definition of a continuity at a point, and where that's what we're gener generally looking at is the definition of continuity, that uh, the limit exists, that it's defined at that point, and that those two values are the same. We can also have uh, look for check for continuity on an open or a closed interval. So I've included a graph of kind of how you can look at to see when something is going to be an open or a closed interval. And next we're going to be taking a look at some basic properties. Uh, continuity laws for some basic functions. So these are very much like your family of functions that you have seen in uh, any other type of math class. A polynomial, by definition, must be smooth and continuous. So, you know, you'd have anything from a linear function to, say, like a third-degree function like that. Uh, rational functions uh, have to be continuous along the domain, except where I have uh, something that would produce a vertical asymptote in the denominator, and that's, that, that's kind of what we're looking at here, vertical asymptotes. Uh, this one here, y is equal to x to the 1 over n power, these are like our roots, like our square root and our cube root. Uh, so it's continuous as long as n is odd. So that would be like, you know, y is equal to the cube root of x, which if you graph it, kind of does one of these little snaky things. And if you have something that's even, like y is equal to the square root of x, well, even uh, root problems or even root functions like this have a restricted domain and so they'll kind of go like that and that's what they're talking about here that's our restricted domain. Sine and cosine functions are going to be continuous and I'm going to have to clear this off so I can slide it down a little bit I'm sorry well, if you needed that stuff go back and pause it and copy it down if you need to. Uh, sine and cosine functions are going to be continuous. And then we have the last two here, the exponential functions, which typically are going to you know, behave like that in some way. The domain is all real numbers, but uh, we can't have a base of 1 because then we wouldn't have an exponential function. And log functions are the inverse of exponential functions, so they will have... Uh, a range of all real numbers, but the domain will be restricted and it'll kind of go something like that. And here where they're talking about inverse functions, we can have a lot of different inverse functions uh, where the output of one function becomes the input of the other one. Uh, but these two are actually very classic inverse functions, uh, exponents and logs. Uh, so here we're coming up to about nine minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this video here and we'll pick it up in part three. If you have any questions about anything you've seen, please let me know. Until then, guys, thanks for watching and take care.